up, up. I left you in the corner there. Okay. Well, first of all, it's a, a great pleasure to be here, Alex, and uh, to give a talk about some of the work we did together. Um, I will have to try to step not on that. Um, okay. So <clears throat> I will be uh, talking about forming uh, ultra cold molecules, but. Um, um, before that, I want to say that I don't have any uh, anecdotes about uh, 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 squash or tennis. I'm more of a winter uh, uh, sport type of guy, so we never really played together any of those sports. Um, anyway, I will uh, quickly uh, mention a few uh, uh, things about how uh, Alex got me here, basically. And then I will talk about forming molecules and a few uh, remarks at the end. So <clears throat> the way I, I got involved with Alex was because I was uh, uh, looking for a project. So in 91, I was at, uh, uh, a student at MIT looking for something to do. And it turns out that uh, a good friend of mine was uh, working with uh, Robin Shakeshaft at, uh, at uh, uh, USC. And he mentioned that uh, there was this guy at Harvard, uh, which I didn't know who he was, uh, who may have some projects, interesting projects. So I went went to see Alex, and I didn't know anything about Alex. Uh, I didn't know much about atomic physics, neither. I was more in, interested in StatMac at the time. And uh, so I went there, and uh, well, he had a big office. So I thought, well, he might be an important person. And then uh, we, we described a few projects which I knew nothing about. And they were all related to cold atoms, basically, except one. But they were all related to cold atoms, and I didn't know anything about cold atoms. Um, and then, then one of the key, feature, key, key issue for me at the time was, uh, you know, do you have funding? Because I was running out of money from a, a Canadian uh, scholarship, and it was very important for me to continue. And of course, he kind of had a small smile, which we all know means a lot. Um, so uh, so uh, he said, yes, no problem. And so when can I start? Basically, tomorrow, if you want. So I started to work with him, and uh, the project he uh, basically gave me was to work on uh, ultra-cold collisions of atoms. Um, and that uh, you know, morphed into, uh, into photosociation of ultra-cold atoms. Uh, after that, he was also quite instrumental in, in uh, uh, getting me to apply to uh, the uh, ITEM postdoc uh, program. Um, uh, even at the time when I applied, it was actually one or two days after the deadline, but he still uh, told me, well, you should apply. So I did, and, and uh, luckily for me. So thank you again. So um, as, as uh, Randy mentioned, uh, some of the work we did, uh, Alex and I, uh, was basically on, on trying to interpret the, uh, some of the experiment that, that uh, Randy was doing. And that gave me my first PRL, so I was very proud of that. And as Randy described, the experiment was basically that uh, he had two series, a, a very persistent one, and something that seems to disappear. And in the paper, we, we showed that, uh, well, the persistent one was probably the triplet, and the one disappearing was a singlet. And this was linked to the sign of the scattering length. Um, as uh, was also explained by, by Francoise, um, the reason why one is disappearing and the other one isn't is linked to uh, the overlap. What the, when you calculate the um, uh, photo association rate, you basically are taking in a sandwich uh, the wave function of the ground state, the free wave function, with the wave function of a bound state you're trying to probe. So if the association occurs, if most in the outer turning point or the outer lobe, of your bound state. So if that happens uh, where your wave function, free wave function is, is large, uh, you get a good signal. But if you go to a lower level, and this happens to correspond to coincide with a, uh, a node in your ground state wave function, you'll get a very small rate. So, but to calculate the, uh, the uh, photo association rate, uh, you, well, you need to, um, well, uh, you assume, for example, if you have a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, you, you calculate this, this object here, which is, the, uh, which is the one that takes into a sandwich your uh, incoming wave function and your target wave function with the transition dipole moment between them. 
Um, uh, and if you are at low temperature, uh, as uh, Brendan likes, Brendan McCarklin likes to, to tease me, you just do S wave scattering, uh, nothing too serious. And therefore, you get a lot of the information in a very uh, simple way. So this was also, uh, uh, as Randy described, what uh, he observed and were able to, to uh, understand the singlet uh, uh, scattering length that they did correspond indeed to a positive scattering length, but not the case of the triplet. So those two, well, these type of work, that's basically what uh, led me to my PhD. So you may recognize some people there. Um, Alex, as Randy said, didn't change it at all. That was December 94. Uh, Dan, who changed a tiny bit, but not much. I had much more hair. And this young guy there is a bit more grayish now. But, uh, <laughs> and, and then in, in June 95, the graduation, um, I took this, I like this picture. There's like two horns there, it seems like. I don't know if it means anything or not, but. <laughs> so, um, this work led to uh, what I think, uh, maybe if, uh, people may, may correct me, I think it was the first proposal how to create cold molecules in, in, a, in a ground state. Um, uh, with Alex in 97. And I remember very well the ICPIC uh, uh, meeting where actually Olivier Dulieu came very uh, uh, excited to our poster uh, to, to, to see exactly what we, we, we have done because we had the abstract. And uh, you were working also at the time, I think, on cold molecules. So, But again, Alex had the, the foresight of, of zooming on that because uh, we had some of those calculations were done in my, in my thesis, and I had, you know, I had tables of numbers, and Alex like, well, we can go, we can use that to, to produce molecules. And again, he, uh, he knew what was important in, the, in those results. So, uh, I will talk very briefly now uh, about possible schemes to produce a cold molecule. One of them is more or less what was in that paper in, in, in 97, which is using uh, uh, photo association to go to an excited state. And, and then you can decay uh, uh, radiatively to a bound, a bound level, or you could go from, with a two photon scheme. Uh, we did some work with Kate, for example, Kate Kirby on, on uh, LIH, and we saw that it could be very nice uh, rates for, for, for formation of molecules. Or you could go, in the case of, of a polar molecule, directly from the continuum. And for all those, uh, there you may have some issue with back stimulation uh, uh, into the continuum. But um, what I will talk about is mostly uh, related to what uh, Randy mentioned now, which is uh, how to uh, use or enhance those photo association rates going with, uh, with a flashback resonance. So, the, um, well, flashback resonances have been used to do uh, study crossover, uh, BC, uh, BCS crossover, and to also form uh, molecules in very um, uh, excited, very loose bound states. Now, the idea is that uh, maybe if you couple this long range here to a shorter range bound state, you could enhance the shorter range uh, uh, wave function of your system or if you want your two, your two atoms while they're colliding, they start dancing around a bit longer. So they spin this reef one, uh, uh, flipping a bit, and then they spend more time at shorter range where they have more probability to be uh, photo associated. So, uh, I, well, Randy showed some results of that, and it looks like, indeed, that's what is going on. So this is a very uh, car, uh, quick cartoon of, of, of what it is. You know, in, in magneto association, you basically use the magnetic field to associate your, your two atoms into a molecule. And in the case of photo association, you use a photon. But it's very, very similar phenomenon. Phenomena. So <clears throat> we uh, therefore went to uh, uh, something that I, I like to call the FOPA, which I like. Uh, it's a flashback optimized photo association. And in there, what you do, you basically take your incoming wave function which you couple with the green one there, which is the, the closed channel. You couple those two together. And what happens is uh, the photo association rate, which was large for high levels here, 
now can be actually large for a system for lower bound levels here, which have a better overlap with deeply bound, uh, shorter region. So to do the calculations, what we do, we, well, we use the full Hamiltonian with all the hyperfine stuff, uh, interactions. Uh, we need all the wave functions um, uh, here and there also, but here. So we need to, uh, uh, we use the Fourier grid method uh, with Philippe Pellegrini. Uh, that was developed in, in, uh, in uh, Orsay, in Mécoton. And then we calculate this rate. And this is what we, we, we uh, the system we were looking for at the beginning was um, how to produce uh, uh, large amounts of polar molecules. And the system we looked at was uh, lithium sodium. And uh, there were an experiment, some measurements made by uh, uh, Wolfgang uh, in 2004 of a few, a few resonances, three resonances, and by um, you know, uh, uh, mapping them, by modifying the, the potentials to get uh, those resonances at the right place, we were convinced that our potentials were uh, well adjusted. And then we looked at that photosociation rate. Um, in the case of lithium sodium, instead of going to an excited state and then coming down, you could go directly from the continuum down because it's a, it has a, a, a dipole moment. So that's what we do. We just look at, as a function of that frequency, you are probing various bound state of this red curve, which is a singlet. And uh, this is what we get. So of course, as a, this is the, the, the levels. And you see that you get this uh, nodal structure that we we're talking about before in your photo association rate. But as a function of the B field, of the uh, of, uh, magnetic field, if you look at your, your rate coefficient, you see that you have sharp increases here. And this is, of course, at the uh, uh, Feshbach resonance. So here are the two resonances we're looking at for a particular channel, entrance channel. And this is the photo association rate we uh, obtain. Now, <clears throat> you'll notice that you, from the, um, the, the, the base, if you want, or the off-resonance uh, photo association rate, you can get many orders of magnitude increase in the rate. That was quite, uh, we we're very happy with that, and, and, uh, and we think that this could be used to produce large amounts of, uh, uh, of uh, polar molecules. Now, you will notice also one interesting thing is that uh, this, these large increases are not only um, when the, um, uh, for, for levels that, that overlap well with the outer turning point of your closed channels, which is what people would you know, uh, usually think about, but also for levels that do not overlap well necessarily with the last, with the, the turning point of the bound state there. And the reason is, well, you get a big enhancement of the wave function at short distance. So here we compare, for example, as a function of the position, the wave function off and on resonance. So the off resonance is the, the, the red one, and the on resonance is the black one. And what you see is that at shorter distance, you have this big, big peak there. This big, big peak is at around 40. So it's over there, somewhere on the wall. So this is at much shorter distance. So you see the black uh, wave function is enhanced even at, uh, at, uh, uh, for, for a shorter distance. And then we just show the overlap for other levels, uh, the wave function for 30 or 5 for the target state. So even for deeply bound target states, you still can get a very large uh, enhancement because your wave function, your entrance channel, if you want, wave function, has been uh, uh, enhanced. So we, we made a, a, a simple model to explain that, which is well, all those calculations were done with, you know, eight or so channels mixed up and so on. But at the end, you can explain everything with a simple two-channel uh, model, where you have an open and a closed channel. So you have your open channel, which is V1, and you have uh, your energy and your scattering function, wave function is psi regular. And, and then you have a bound state in a closed channel of uh, surface e, uh, 2. So you just look at uh, two-channel coupling, and you can show that uh, the wave function 
in the one and in the two uh, uh, channels, if you want, will, ha will take those forms. So <clears throat> you get a, a um, one of a cosine of the resonant phase shift for the uh, in that channel, and in the other one, you get a, a sine of the phase shift. So if you put that into your transition matrix element, the dipole and your psi total, um, you'll find that uh, this, uh, you, you, you have both the state one and the state two you need to consider. But basically, what will that give you is a tangent for one term and a sine of the phase shift on the uh, other term. And if you take all that outside your transition moment, you basically get the, this term and one plus something times a tangent and another something plus the sine. Those, those coefficients are just the overlap of your target state with the irregular and the regular part of your entrance uh, uh, of your uh, wave functions. And this is with the, uh, the closed channel wave functions. So, those C1 and C2 do depend on the exact uh, wave function, so you can have interference, which, and then it could be uh, uh, small or large, positive, negative. So it depends, but um, basically the form is quite simple. So when you use that form, you can get that the rate coefficient has this simple form, and if you take the, the, the mm, now well accepted way to, to uh, model the scattering length and you put that into this expression, um, you get the, uh, sorry, you get those curves, the, 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 the red curves. So those are just with, uh, uh, you have two parameters, C1 and C2, and the phase shift is well known because of the scattering length and therefore uh, it's a very simple way to, to get information about the the uh, resonances as well. So if you measure the uh, photo association rates uh, and you don't know the scattering length, for example, you could get all the parameters, the, 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 the width, the position, and the A background as well from mat, uh, mapping that. Uh, <clears throat> so this is, these are the results for the three original uh, resonances that uh, uh, Wolfgang measured. So it's just uh, a different entrance channel, so you get uh, it, but it's all the same, the same physics. So we, of course, then uh, uh, hearing at uh, DAMOP a year or well, a year and a half ago now uh, that Randy was working on something quite similar, basically on lithium two. Uh, we also uh, uh, went and looked at that system. So in this case, you go up and then you have uh, you have uh, you go into different levels and then they uh, de decay out of the trap, basically. So that's how you can uh, detect them. And this is what we did as a function of the, the B field. Again, you see this nodal structure. This is for various target state you go into there. And you basically see the same thing. You have a very strong enhancement, and you have a minimum before. And um, if you, we look at the level V equal 83, which is the one, that, uh, one of the levels that Randy was working with, uh, we see very large enhancement. In our case, we, for, for this is at one milliwatt per square centimeters, the intensity, you see three orders of magnitude increase, which is pretty big. Uh, <clears throat> so if we look at the closed channel and the entrance or open channel wave function, this is the square of the wave function, you see again, this is the, the wave function, but you see that the amplitude is increased drastically at the resonance. Same thing is true with the closed channel. So everything is get enhanced at the resonance. So <clears throat> um, if we just look at what Randy was showing before and we take the old result here, uh, we see that uh, the shape is pretty uh, comparable. His uh, measurements were done at, uh, there were some variations in, in the temperature, but around 10 uh, microkelvin laser intensity of 1.7 or so watt per square centimeters. These were his densities. This here is at uh, 5 microkelvin, 1 milliwatt. And, uh, but if we, uh, we uh, since uh, our discussions uh, while no, at, at DAMOP, I guess, um, we, uh, we redid the calculation exactly or close to the, exactly the same parameters. So 
intensities of 1.6 watt per square centimeters, temperature of 10 micro Kelvin. And now um, we, we put a, a, a uh, inserting of 45%, which might be a bit too big, we can argue, but in that range, between 25 and 40%, I guess, in that range. So, and now, um, uh, um, as opposed to the figure that, that, uh, that uh, Randy was showing, uh, on this one, what we did is we, um, we multiplied our, our rate by two, because what Randy was measuring is the atom loss rate, and we're measuring the formation of molecules, which is you take two molecules, uh, two atoms to make more, one, uh, a molecule, so you have a factor of two. When we do that, we see that the agreement is, is fairly good. This is a log scale. This is the magnetic field, so this is the rate. And this is, again, a zoom of the minimum. This is also on a log scale. And this is a, a, a zoom of the maximum, but on a linear scale now. So you see that, except for the, f the, 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 the top point there, all the others are basically within the error, uh, error bar. So uh, of course, um, one question is what exactly is going on there, but uh, um, well, at this point, uh, there might be uh, issues with our theory, but there might be also issues with it was very difficult to measure the top point, if I remember well. But we can argue. Um, but, I, I, but nonetheless, I mean, there's no, no adjustable parameters here. It, it's, it's, so uh, anyone uh, doing a photo association calculation, usually if you get within a factor of two, you're very happy. If you get uh, within the same, the same order of magnitude, it's great. So here, it's, it's no adjustable parameters. We are right, uh, right on it. So uh, another interesting thing is that if you look at, uh, as a function of, of the, the B field, but for various V, you look at uh, the position of the maximum, which is here. And you look at the position of the minimum. The minimum seems to do a, cre a, a crescent uh, shape. So uh, Randy did measure the position of the minimum for a few levels for 84, 83, and 82. So if you look at our plot here, actually the uh, trajectory, if you want, of the minimum is in good agreement with, with those, those results. So the interesting thing is if you map out that, around 62 or so, something will happen. The minimum will, will, will shift, will be on the other side of the resonance. And this is just because uh, the position of the minimum is, is due to destructive interference, if you want, between your, wave, your incoming wave function and your target wave function. And this is very sensitive to the details. And uh, so the maximum is basically not sensitive. It depends on the resonance itself, the position, etc. But the minimum is very sensitive. And if you map out that minimum, it could actually give you uh, very accurate information about the, the fine details of your potentials. Another uh, uh, thing which is very interesting to study with, with this faux pas uh, technique is, is uh, saturation effects. So as uh, Randy was saying, uh, this is from their older experiment in uh, 2003. Um, this is what they observed, and this was the line from the same paper. We did calculations. This was in the state 2.2 for the, uh, for the uh, lithium. So uh, we also, well, basically get a, a good agreement. Uh, so what we do now is we compute uh, the photo association rate for the state 1-1, one, one, where you have a feshbach resonance, because the state 2-2, two, two, you do not have a feshbach resonance, and, um, and see how this, this uh, photo association rate, the saturation, is, is modified by uh, the, the resonance. So the blue curve is for the state 1-1 one, one also, at zero field, zero magnetic field, and the, the dashed line is when you are very close to resonance. So what you find out is actually that this, you reach this saturation limit at very small laser intensities. Actually, about a factor of, you know, if you think that this is where you get it, at about 20 or so, you get it at much, much smaller uh, uh, laser intensities. So what this tells you is that feshbach resonances enhance the photo association rate and enhance also, therefore, uh, uh, well, all your, your uh, matrix element, and you reach the saturation uh, limit very quickly. So this is just a zoom to show that. So if, if you see that you know, at 20, well, you, you look at the, it's not exactly the same parameters. But uh, you look where things happen, 
it happens more or less at the same, uh, same place. So it's very uh, encouraging that uh, we get a, uh, a decent agreement there. But this is not in a BEC, so it's all in, in thermal gases. I mean, two minutes. Okay, well, um, if now you, you look at, at what happens if you uh, vary the intensity, uh, it turns out that um, uh, as a function of the B field also, you will get a kind of uh, doubling uh, of the peaks. So, um, and this is related to this, uh, this uh, stimulated gamma, stimulated uh, um, um, width, if you want. Uh, uh, the rate cannot be larger, uh, or, or the integrand here cannot be larger than one. So whenever it reaches one, it's the maximum it can go. And then after that, it, it starts to decrease. If you increase gamma, the big gamma, it will start to decrease. So when you go through a resonance, your, your, basically your rate is increasing. And if you pass or you hit this, this uh, uh, limit, it will cannot go higher. So it will, have, it will start going down. And then the gamma will again start to decrease. So this will go up. And then it decreases further. It will go down. So you will expect some double features like that. So that would be very interesting to, to measure that, to, to observe that. Um, there's other ways where you can actually use, uh, maybe uh, uh, use this FOPA method with stirrup to form molecules. But this is, uh, well, anyway, there's no time to talk about it. So a few remarks. Uh, as it was mentioned before, um, ultra-cold molecules are interesting for high-precision spectroscopy, superchemistry, quantum computing, possibly. Um, and the FOPA method is, is promising to form deeply bound molecules. And, um, and basically, the future is bright for, for, for uh, that, that approach, I think. Now, I want to make a few more remarks about a possible explanation for the uh, very uh, successful career of Alex. Uh, beside the famous eyebrows that everybody mentioned, uh, I noticed uh, that, uh, well, one of the reasons for his success might be some kind of, is there some magic involved there? Um, well, he doesn't really need a magic potion. He just has a, a magic mind. Some of you may recognize that, that uh, figure. Uh, how many of you read Asterix and Obelix? OK, for the others, it might not make a lot of sense. but. Uh, this is the druid in, in Asterix and Obelix. He's basically the person making uh, the magic potion so that the Gauls can win over the Romans at all uh, time. So you can see here, or oh, this is a, the famous uh, 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 potion uh, marmot in French. But you see that um, instead of, of a, 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 a um, um, what's the name in English? Uh, a, a chemistry uh, flask. Um, he has the chalk. So that's, that's basically his magic wand, I think. Another possibility for, for Alex's uh, uh, success is that actually uh, he has a license to find instead a, uh, of a, a license to kill. <laughs> so, uh, of course, some of you may have recognized another uh, uh, person of, of Scottish origin. Uh, <laughs> So uh, um, I find that uh, quite amazing that uh, uh, there also the eyebrow seems to play a, a big role. Anyway, with that, uh, I just would like to thank everybody in my group. Uh, a lot of the work presented here was done uh, by Philippe Pellegrini, a postdoc in, in my group, working with me, and by Marco and also Zoran. And um, a lot of the work in, in Photo Association was done with Kate. I didn't present anything on quantum computing, but I'm working with Suzanne Yellen also there. And of course, a big thank to Alex for all his help and work on that. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? The only disagreement in your calculation in our data is that the, is that the peak, yeah. close to the Feshbach resonance, which is also where 
we're seeing this discrepancy with uh, with this rogue footed association thing. Have you um, have you looked at the limit at different magnetic fields, and, and would your calculation show any field dependence if there was one near the Feshbach resonance for the limit, not we, for the rate, but for the we, rate we, limit? We haven't, and this is uh, something that uh, um, would be interesting to to see. I'm not sure if. The way we define our limit is just basically that the integrant is one, and I'm not sure it doesn't. Okay, uh, I'm not sure we would necessarily see anything different there. Our limit is set by this simple, uh, simple idea that the S matrix uh, LM is one. So I don't have anything else in, in the in the theory, but uh, it would be interesting to uh, to to check that if we can come up with with uh, something. Yeah. Other question. Robert, I have a question about the saturation of photo association. Now, did I understand you correctly that your theory is a two-body theory? Yeah. So you would not reproduce any many-body effects on saturation. No. No, and haven't. then, uh, in terms of length scale, Randy was saying uh, the photo association rate which saturates can be represented by length scale is then the length scale which the only length scale which can come out of your theory, the unitarity limit, which is at the Broglie wavelengths? Yeah. So you would actually predict that for lower and lower temperatures, when the Broglie wavelengths diverges, you can actually, your theory would support higher and higher limits for the saturation. Well, yeah, basically it goes like one over the, 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 one over the temperature, basically, and uh, everything diverges. But again, I have no no, no many body effects, no nothing in there. Yeah.